today I, uh, I did a cool thing. I learned how to use Keynote. There are people in my life that would think this was not possible. But it turns out that um, really, let's see if I can make this uh, happen. It turns out that Keynote, Keynote's really not that smart. You know, like he'll pretty much do it. In fact, he's being very nice to me today. He'll pretty much do whatever I tell him to do. Um, and you can see he's, uh, he's, he's helpful and, uh, and easy to use. And also, he's, uh, he's somebody that, he's, he's nice to me. And he's, he's nice to me in several different typefaces. He's, he's, it's easy to get him to like you in lots of different ways. Uh, he does these things that are like little, pre forgive me if I'm excited about this, maybe you're not. Um, he does these like little displays of shiny objects. And he, you know, he's like a dog that just goes gets a bone for you. And uh, another one, this is kind of nifty. And you know, you can, you can kind of see that he, he, um, he has, you know, he has a personality in a way, and, and, he, and he's gotten to like me a lot, I think. He, he also uses, he uses my favorite typeface, which is uh, Baskerville. And uh, it's funny because I thought, you know, how could a program like actually understand that I would like a typeface, you know, from back in the turn of the century or something. And um, so, you know, but he, he knows I like Baskerville. It's amazing. And, um, and you know, I, 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 uh, I, I think that I've gotten a good relationship with him that he kind of understands, like, you know, what, what, I, what, I, um, what I'm about. Um, and, you know, and I told him what my, my talk was going to be like. And, uh, and, he, and, and he seemed to be really into it. Um, actually, I, and I thought, I thought, um, I thought it's a, you know it's only it's only fair to, to involve an intelligent like piece of digital work like this in in what's going on here today. Um, thank you for indulging that. <laughs> I, You, you can't imagine how afraid I was to get up here and screw that up. <laughs> well, I'd like to talk for a while about one of my pet obsessions, which is this thing that uh, Sunita referred to as unknowing. Um, and after that, I'm going to transition to another topic, which is not unconnected, which I call a, a CMO survival guide for life in the new marketing badlands. It, 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 it's gently critical of CMOs. So if there are some here, it, it's well-meaning. It's meant to be well-meaning. Anyway, the unknowing part, um, Sunita told me this was very important to cover in detail, even though it sounded a little anti-intellectual and like the wrong thing to do, to unknow something. Um, she set this up pretty well. Either that or she was setting me up when she said, go ahead and talk about it. I'm not sure which one. But um, my, my obsession with unknowing is a simple reaction to just sitting through too many presentations where planners and creative directors and so on, you know, talk, told the client that they were going to take deep dives into their business and learn so much about them and use the, the drill down, unpack uh, kind of language that we've all found ourselves using. And you slap yourself in the forehead and go, God, if my kids saw that. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I've got a reaction to that kind of thing that I think is. Um, is, is sort of visceral after years of doing it. I mean, first of all, there's no way that an agency is going to know more about your business than you do. You know, they'll say they'll know as much as you do, but they're not going to. They have other things to work on. They have sneaker accounts and beer and stuff that's more fun than your account. <laughs> uh, so things are going to happen. Um, smart clients look for agencies to be additive in a perspective about what they are. And, you know, and, that, and, and that's a good thing. Um, but what if an agency did the opposite and aggressively, you know, not just learned nothing about you, but actually unlearned all the pitiful stuff that people all knew about you that could be right, could be wrong, who knew? And strangely, this is the state in which I think your agency is most useful to you. Um, the English poet John Keats talked about a thing called negative capability, which was you know, the ability to actually back away and not know something and look at, look at the world in a new way. And I think that's what agencies can do. Because once you unlearn everything, you know, you can relearn it all in new, fresh ways. 
And um, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll reinvent things, you'll see things anew, you'll find things there that people didn't see before. And smart people will pay you more money to unlearn things than to learn them, you'll find. At least this, this is what we tell our clients. Um, and when you think about it, it's harder to unlearn than it is to learn in many ways. And, and I think people skip this step. I've got a few examples of unlearning, um, which, are, which I think are fun. One of my favorites is, is from back in the 60s, and this is kind of a fun story. It involved a faltering piano company called Aeolian in New York. And um, they were a competitor of Steinway. And an agency called Cresser and Robbins had their owner, Bud Robbins, went across the street to, uh, he's, well, he's, he's, he was getting frustrated about beating Steinway. Um, traditionally, you know, he did ads that talked about the tone of the piano and the action of the piano and, you know, the beauty of music and, and so on. And that stuff wasn't working. So he decided to look at pianos not as musical instruments, but sort of as washing machines or, you know, like mixing things in the kitchen, uh, cars, things that, that were useful, not, not, as, uh, not, not as abstractions. And he decided to go to the Aeolian uh, factory. And he went there. And he was looking inside one of the pianos, and he saw this thing. I think I have a picture of it. He saw this thing. It's, it's this bar with the type here. It's called, if you don't know what it, maybe, maybe you understand the function of pianos. It's the Capodastro bar, OK? And he said, uh, what's that, to one of the guys putting the piano together? And the guy said, oh, that's the Capodastro bar. Uh, it keeps the piano from warping. That sounded like a dead end. And then the guy said, actually, it doesn't even do that. It, it does that after 50 years. So after 50 years, the Capodastro bar kicks in and keeps your piano from warping. And Bud says, you mean, so I'm paying for something in this piano that doesn't actually do anything for 50 years. And he said, yeah, I never thought about it that way, but that's, that's true. And uh, he said, you know, now he had something to write about. It wasn't heritage. It wasn't an abstraction. He was like, you know, holy shit, this is something that I can advertise. The piano is that good. There are parts in it that don't even work for 50 years. And I, th <laughs> I think that's a great piece of unknown. I mean, to back up, ask about that, find out about it, and go, my god, that's something very different from what other people have. So I love that story. Um, in 1983, we uh, started our company with an account called Amazing Software. It had come to us from a couple guys down in the Silicon Valley. And uh, it, was a, it was a time when you, know, you were still playing games on Atari machines and, and Nintendos, the original kind of Nintendo. It's 1983. And, um, and computer games were brand new. Like people, they didn't know what computer games would become. They, you know, they were afraid of them in some ways. You know, could a computer actually be fun to play a game on? Um, and we, uh, you know, the games had been around for a while, and, 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 but they'd never really made it on computers yet. Um, so we, we uh, thought about this, and we thought, well, computers have so much more power than these little boxes, the little Atari boxes. Maybe we could do more expansive things with them. So we changed the name of the company from Amazing Software to a place called Electronic Arts. And this was the first ad that we did, and it was entitled, Can a Computer Make You Cry? Which at the time was a crazy idea. I mean, you had to back way up to think that a computer might be something that could make you cry. You know, computers were things that added stuff. They did your taxes, maybe. They, they, um, they, they did documents for you. But this was way ahead of its time. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit of the copy, because I liked it. Right now, no one knows, can a computer make you cry? This is partly because many would consider the very idea frivolous. But it's also because whoever successfully answers this question must answer several others. Why do we cry? Why do we laugh or love or smile? What are the touchstones of our emotions? Until now, the people who asked such questions tended not to be the same people who ran software companies. Instead, they were writers, filmmakers, painters, musicians. They were, in the traditional sense, artists. We're about to change that tradition. The name of our company is Electronic Arts. Great example of unlearning, unlearning what a computer could do, backing up, going, could it be something so much more than something you play a little game on, shoot aliens on? <clears throat> so at the time, a very interesting thing. So uh, whose responsibility is it to, uh, to do this kind of thing? I mean, I, 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 like, 
I like the idea that we, we should all feel the responsibility of backing up and looking at, at these problems anew and unlearning the things that we think about all the time. If you find yourself going over the same ground, um, to try, to try to get out of that ground and go to another place, you know, and, I, and people ask me, well, you know, what are the secrets of creativity and so on? And I, I tell them, drive a different way to work every day, you know? Like, do something different, you know, don't shave with your other hand. Do something different with your life and, and break out of your routine. And I think that's all this is really saying about what we do every day. The person whose responsibility this is, you know, is, um, it, it's everybody in the company, but many times it's the chief marketing officer's responsibility. Um, and he or she has to figure out how to make this happen. They have to take the time and initiative and create the space and invite it to happen. Um, and, and, you know, and, I, and it brings me to the second part of my talk today because I feel like fewer and fewer CMOs are willing to take this task on in a really hard and fast way because you have to be brave to do it. In fact, they kind of find ingenious ways to deflect the responsibilities of this task onto the organization, the people around them, the agency, which is my own personal, you know. Um, I don't want to deflect it onto me. Um, but it's, I, I really admire it when the CMO takes responsibility for this kind of thing because I think it leads the organization. Um, a CMO that I was working with a little while back, this is a great quote, he had just gotten fired. And he said, I learned my lesson. I'm gonna get fired in the end anyway. From now on, I'm just gonna go for it from day one. <laughs> and, and I think that's a really interesting lesson for us to learn, you know, to, to not waste our time. Um, the, you know, it, it, this guy is a very brash character, but it made me think, you know, if the average CM, CMO's tenure, and somebody mentioned this, is, is just over two years, you know, 2.4 years according to the ANA in the U.S., you know, you don't have that much time to get this stuff done. You know, you have to act that way. You know, do you want to, and I made a list of this stuff, do you really want to use half that time up pronouncing your predecessor a complete idiot? precipitously firing the agency, conducting all new market research to explain why the brand has stalled, hiring an agency search consultant, meeting dozens of agencies all over the world, narrowing the field once or twice, conducting tissue sessions, traveling widely for final presentations, hiring an agency, developing a new campaign, launching the campaign, finally waiting for the new campaign to gain traction enough to replace the old campaign, which has either gone really stale or has not been running at all throughout this process, causing everyone in the chief suite to start glancing at their watches and wondering what's going on. You can kind of tell I've been through a couple of experiences like this recently. <laughs> I don't like them. <laughs> so all too often at the end of this kind of process, you know, you hear a CMO like scurrying away from the only possible benefits of the whole thing, saying something like, don't forget we're picking an agency, not a campaign. You know, it's like, what? It's been months. You know, you have to have more than just an agency at the end of this thing. Um, this is not healthy. It's dithering. You know, it's not productive. It's dithering. And almost every CMO of any stature that, I, that I've met up with has very ready opinions about what campaigns they love. They have very ready opinions about who the best four or five agencies or the, the funnest four or five agencies for them to work with would probably be. But the moment they get into this job, they totally forget all that stuff for some reason, and you know, it's like they're from the planet Zork or something. Um, if you need a search consultant to make this decision, that's cool. Um, tell them you want an agency in a month. Give them an idea of your favorite agencies. Tell them you want to narrow it down. You want to have a decision in a month. Then when you get the agency, tell them you want the campaign a month after that. It will happen, and it'll be good. Um, in their book, In Search of Excellence, Tom Peters and Robert Waterman talk about having a bias for action. Um, what I'm seeing lately is exactly the opposite. There's too much bias for inaction. There's too much comfort in inaction. It's expensive. Inaction is expensive. It's expensive for your career. So seizing responsibility on these things squeezes time and gets things done. Um, consensus consensus decision-making in which everybody's opinion, that thing where you go around the table and everybody is, everybody's asked about what's going on, is the enemy of action. You know, the CMO speaks last is too nice to everybody, is not clear, doesn't sum it up, the clock's ticking. You know, many CMOs don't speak at meetings because they don't want to be on the record about something. The clock's ticking on you. You know, drawn out research replaces hunches in humanity. 
uh, crowdsourcing. It, crowdsourcing is, is, you know, it's, it's useful sometimes, and God knows we've had great luck with uh, Doritos crowdsourcing that we do every year at the Super Bowl. But it's, it's not the solution all the time. And in many ways, it is a very um, ingenious kind of way of deflecting responsibility for getting anything. You know, nobody has to be responsible for it. The source made the crowd made it, you know. We didn't make that. You know, we just did what the crowd said. So nobody's ever, you know, um, responsible in the end. And, uh, and, and now, you know, all too many companies are actually avoiding picking an agency at all. You know, they're taking it in-house or doing it in some, some different kind of format. And uh, instead of having one or several agencies, which makes a lot of sense, um, they, they have an internal thing, which is fine. I think that if, if you're Apple or Google and you can, you know, wash money upon it and fix it, but in many cases, it's sort of a, you know, in a, in a leaner company, uh, it's sort of a sorcerer's apprentice thing. It's like, yikes, what's going on? Um, and this all sounds like I don't have any sympathy for CMOs. I actually think it's the hardest job in the company now, in many ways. Think about how, how much it's grown. Again, I made another list. You're not, you're, you're not just responsible for advertising and research, but for internal and external corporate communications, social media, PR, the company's internet presence, countering snipey comments about the company's internet presence, any and all stupid photos that go leaked public, leaked documents and ill-advised blog posts by employees. You're working your ass off, you know? I mean, it's a hard job. But indecision and the lack of decisiveness is making it worse. Um, John Hegarty, somebody who's quoting here, I saw a great quote from him recently. He believes that the problem is really that people don't know what the CMO actually has to do because and his quote was, they failed to gain traction on the boards, CMOs. They failed to get companies to understand what they're doing. The accountants set up the figures, but they don't understand all the soft stuff, like the CMO work, which of course is where all the value is. And so the chief marketing officers are not being taken seriously. Hegarty says CMOs have no passion for the business, which is kind of a generalization, but you know, that's, that's the effect here. Jean-Marie Drew told a little story about um, about Steve Jobs this morning, and I, and I have a, a story about a decisive CMO, and of course, Steve Jobs was the most decisive CMO in history. Um, in 1997, I think Jean-Marie reminded me, um, Jobs came back to work at, at Apple again after having been sent in, uh, in exile. And, um, you know, he had worked with Shiat Day all those years, and of course, knew Lee Clow, and, Jean-Marie and all these guys, and, 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 um, and, and oddly, he called us up. Now, we had had a really bad meeting with Clow at some point, but Cl and Clow with, uh, with Jobs at some point, but um, Steve was the kind of guy that, you know, on a certain day, you'd have a really bad meeting. On another day, you'd have a really good meeting. You shouldn't trust either one of those things. Um, so he said, come down here. I want to tell you uh, what's going on. And so we went down there, and he sort of suggested that he might want to have a pitch for this business. And he started telling us about this, about what his problem was. And I can, I can see him. He was wearing a yellow sweater, and he had a bow tie on. This was before he got into the black T-shirt thing. And, um, and he was really, you know, he looked like a preppy kind of all. And he put some numbers up. He said, we're, we're really in deep shit here, you know. Look at, look at what's happening to us. IBM is killing us. You know, uh, we have no product. Um, we've got nothing to talk about. There's nothing good in development at all. I can tell you, there's nothing good being done. What am I going to do about this? And we were like, I hope we don't have to answer this today. Um, <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Right now, we, we try to sell Apple products to businesses. They, you know, we think that we can get an Apple box on business desks, you know, in big companies. That's not going to happen. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to even try. All that is over. We're not going to make machines for businesses. We're just going to stop. We're only going to make machines for two kinds of people. People like you that are creative people, the people that change the world. Scientists, designers, advertising people, people that, you know, that, are, that, that have an arty side to themselves, and students. We want to sell the suits to students. Nobody else. That's our market. Everybody else, if they, if they want to be part of that cool group, they can, they can aspire to it. Because he said, everybody will want to be part of that group. Nobody wants to be part of our group now. Everybody will be, want to be part of those people who think different. 
So he did that whole thing in about five minutes, and I was like, holy shit, he really is smart. And, you know, it was amazing. It was the most amazing business presentation I've ever seen. And, you know, we know what's happened since then and, and, and what Triad Day do, did with them. And, you know, and, and, and we said, why don't you just hire those guys back and go do this? It's obviously great. And, uh, and then, of course, that's what they did. But um, I, I thought it was one of the most decisive CMO thinking moments I'd ever seen. And obviously, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a guy that had great instincts and great talent for knowing what to do next. Obviously, I love, I love the passion of this stuff, and I hope you do too. It's a, it's a really wonderful business to be in in many ways. But uh, we have to constantly remind ourselves to be brave about the, uh, the unknowing part and to be passionate about things. When you, when you love something, you know, make it happen. Get people around you to do it. I know that sounds really easy to say at a conference like this, but it's something to take home with you and, and, and think about because passion all by itself is inspiring. And, um, and the people around you will feed off it and, and it'll change something. I mean, even if they disagree with you, even if you get fired, it'll change something. You might be part of the change, but <laughs> it'll change something. And, it, and it's really important. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you.